trot moorings can seem a little daunting at first, particularly if you're used to swinging moorings or pontoon berths. So this short video is designed to share some tips and techniques to reduce crew stress, whether you're new to a trot or just want to hone your skills. The trot mooring buoys are the connection between your boat and the riverbed. Beneath each is a heavy chain riser and a concrete block. The risers have to cope with a tidal range of over 5 metres, so the buoys do move about a bit as the tide ebbs and floods. Unlike a swinging mooring though, the buoys in each trot are connected to each other, either by the boats and their mooring lines, or by bridle ropes. You need to supply and fit two bow and two stern mooring lines, each made up of a length of chain and a warp. The chain needs to be reasonably heavy, 10mm galvanised anchor chain is ideal, and around 1.5 to 2 metres long. The warp needs to be shackled to it with a spliced galvanised thimble. 16mm three strand polyester is ideal. It's easy on the hands and has about a 5 tonne braking strain. It's also quite elastic to absorb shock loads. It's easy to splice, but don't be tempted to make bespoke length warps with spliced loops dropped over your cleats. In heavy weather or fast tide, it'd be impossible to lever them off. Having spent good money on warps, you need to make them last, so anti-chafe protection is vital. Don't be tempted to use stainless steel shackles or thimbles. They're more expensive and will cause galvanic corrosion in the chain and moorings. The chain is pretty much chafe proof, unlike this rope which has become wrapped around it. The most important job that the chain performs is to keep your mooring lines tight, even when the tide is slack and the wind is calm. This reduces the risk of warps getting caught under your rudder or on your boarding ladder if you have one. So to summarise part one, you need two mooring lines at both bow and stern, consisting of one and a half to two metres of galvanised chain and a generous length of three strand warp. Each warp needs a galvanised thimble to connect it to the chain. Don't use stainless fittings and make sure the shackle pins are moused so they don't work loose, but also grease the threads so you can remove them at the end of the season. Use plastic tubing to protect your warps from chafe. Don't splice loops into the free end of the warps to drop over your cleats though. They'll be impossible to release under load. Finally, inspect your lines and shackles regularly. Your boat depends upon them. Let's start by looking at single trot moorings. At the start of the season there will be just a bridle line between your buoys. It's provided by Dart Harbour. It does the vital job of keeping the trot correctly spaced. Don't allow the buoys to move apart as this is a very bad thing, as we'll see later. By the end of winter this line will be very slimy and weedy. Your first job will be to shackle on your chains and lines, best done from a dinghy. Connect the uptied lines first, add a mooring connector line with a buoy on it, and then finish with a downstream buoy. Your lines need to have lots of slack in them so you can pick them up from the water. You can now approach in your uh, lifeboat. Approach into the tide and from the leeward side of the trot so you don't get blown down onto the lines. Pick up the mooring lines with a boat hook, get the bow lines onto your forward cleats, then secure the aft lines. As the boat pulls on the buoys, the bridle line will slacken so you can pick it up and tie it off so it doesn't get fouled around your propeller. Most people don't like a weedy bridle line hanging off their boat, so you can coil it up and then ask the Dart Harbour River Patrol to take it away for cleaning and storage. We're ready to leave the mooring, but with the bridle line removed, we need to make our lured mooring lines do its job. Tie a strong connecting line as tight as you can between them and drop them into the water. Now tie a second but longer connecting line between the windward mooring lines and release them as you motor away. The weight of the other boats downstream will pull the first line tight, but your second line will be loose enough to make it easy to pick up on your return. Here's what happens if you don't leave one tight and one loose line. Both mooring lines here have been joined with one connecting line and a buoy, and the two mooring buoys have now moved apart. This is a very bad thing 
for two reasons. First, as the downstream trots get smaller and the last boat on the trot is in real danger of chafing her bows against the downstream buoy. Secondly, the two lines are now really tight and if this was a mid trot, it'd be impossible to pick them up. Hauling five yachts against a one to two knot current is just not gonna happen. Here, two of the Dart Harbour River officers are shortening an over long trot. One boat has to use plenty of engine power to drag the boy upstream while his colleague shortens the line. So to summarize this section, first of all, get to know the correct length of your mooring. It'll be defined by the Dart Harbour bridle line. Use the bridle line to maintain the correct spacing, but if you do decide to remove it, one of your mooring lines has to do its job. Don't let the mooring boys spring apart. It's a really bad thing. It's nearly always best to approach the mooring against the tide and from the leeward side to reduce the risk of running over your lines. If this means pointing the boat downriver against the flood, then that's fine, but it is recommended that you turn the boat to face upstream whenever you can. For a double trot mooring, most of what's just been said still applies, but there are actually some advantages when it comes to picking up your mooring. You'll need some extra mooring tackle as well as your main mooring lines. First, a bow breast line to your neighbour. It needs to be stretchy. Then a bow spring and a stern spring. It's the responsibility of the second yacht to arrive to supply these, and it's good to make them off at the centre cleat so it's easy for either boat to let go. You'll also need a stern breast rope. Stretchy again. Lots of very good well inflated fenders are vital and if you cherish your shiny gel coat, spotlessly clean fender socks and or a fender blanket will be needed. Don't tie your fenders to your guard rails or they'll stretch them. Finally, if you're on a sailing yacht, be aware that the two boats may roll out of sync in strong winds and there's a danger that the rigs might clash. Make sure your masts aren't directly opposite each other. So we're about to leave the mooring and the first job we do is to remove the bow and stern springs. We replace them with a single short loop between the two boats midships cleats or around the bottom of the shrouds if there isn't a cleat. We can now coil up the springs to clear the decks. We now need our mooring connecting line. We use an old Genoa sheet with a couple of small fenders attached as floats. We uncleat the first of the down tied mooring lines, the stern one in this case, and pass it across to a neighbouring boat where your crew will tie it to the connecting line and hang it on a winch. We now do the same at the bow and our boat is now hanging on our neighbour's mooring lines. With the engine on and the helmsman using the tide and or engine to keep us parallel, the bow line is cast off and then the stern line. We are now just held in place by that short centre loop. When we are both ready and it's all clear around us to leave, we cast off the centre loop and then use the tide and engine to ferry glide away from our neighbour. Leaving our mooring lines hooked onto the boat like this keeps them dry, clean and out of danger. The connecting line between them is rigged outside everything, so if this boat decides to leave as well, they can throw our lines into the water. They must of course rig one of their lines to act as a bridle before they cast off, to prevent the boys springing apart, because as we now know, this is a very bad thing. Some people leave their mooring lines just hung amidships like this, but they will rub against the anti-fouling and could even loop underneath the boat. We're heading back to our mooring 
and always approach into the tide. So if it's flooding, don't be afraid to point downstream unless you're particularly adept at reversing. Our neighbour is still there, so no boat hooks required. We'll pretend he's a pontoon and we'll use that short centre loop as our first warp. We ferry glide against the current and aim to get the two midships cleats opposite each other. We pull the loop tight and make off. The helmsman stays at the wheel to keep the boats parallel while the crew moves across to the other boat to accept the aft breast rope. With the wheel locked off to keep the bows in, we can now move forward to make fast the breast rope and then pick up at our leisure the two bow mooring lines. Once they're secure, we can move aft to the aft mooring lines before finally we can fit the bow and stern springs and rearrange the fenders. So to summarise for a doubled up trot mooring, you need to supply bow and stern breast lines plus bow and stern springs. Make sure that you're really well fended and don't leave the masts directly opposite each other to avoid the risk of the rigs clashing. When leaving or approaching the mooring, treat your neighbour's boat as a very handy pontoon. The short centre loop is a great technique to make life really easy and safe, especially if you're short-handed. If the second boat of the mooring leaves, they must fit a bridle line, or else use one of their mooring lines to act as a bridle to stop the boys springing apart. Because, as we know, this would be a very bad thing. Of course, you'll have noticed that the filming conditions were perfect here. But sadly, that's not always the case. If you're the windward boat on a trot, then leaving the mooring can be challenging in strong winds or adverse tides. Don't be afraid to call one of the river officers for help. Call Dart Nav on channel 11. They'd much rather assist in the early stages than have to come and help untangle you if it's all gone a bit horribly wrong. Finally, particularly after heavy weather, it's important to check your mooring regularly. One of the stern warps on this boat parted after an early August gale. Fenders can also pop out between the two boats if they roll at different frequencies in heavy weather. Well, we hope this video has been helpful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact Dart Harbour for more information.